Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. I'm Lisa Mack, and I'm an attorney at Minami Tamaki in San Francisco and a board member of the California APA Bar Association. Thank you for joining us for the third week of our conference series, APA Lawyers, Perspectives on Allyship. This series was prompted by the recent horrific deaths of Black Americans and the ensuing movement of racial reckoning in our country. Each week, we discuss different aspects of history, relationships, and allyship between the API and Black communities. Today's panel will focus on areas of solidarity for API and Black communities. We'll examine historical models of solidarity, as well as current allyship strategies in the context of different social institutions that perpetuate systemic racism. If you have any questions for our panelists as we go along, please type them into the chat box and we'll try to answer some of them at the end of our program. I am honored now to introduce our distinguished panelists for today. Sun Young Choi Moro is the Executive Director of the National Asian Pacific American Women's Forum, also known as NAPOF. And it's our nation's only organization dedicated to building power with APA women and girls to create systemic changes to improve the quality of our lives. Sun Young has led NAPOF for the past four years by building grassroots organizing capacity, leadership development, and strategic legislative work. She also sits on the board of HANA Center, a Korean American immigrant rights organization in Chicago. Diane Fujino is a professor and interim chair of Asian American Studies at the University of California, Santa Barbara. Her scholarship centers on Asian American and Black liberation movements. Among many other books and publications, she is the author of Heartbeat of Struggle, The Revolutionary Life of Yuri Kochiyama, who we will hear more about in today's discussion. Beginning next year, she will serve as co-editor-in-chief of the Journal of Asian American Studies. Professor Fujino is also in the core leadership of the Ethnic Studies Now Santa Barbara Coalition, and she serves on the board of directors for the Fund for Santa Barbara. Finally, Paul Jung is a co-founder of the nonprofit organization, Asian and Pacific Islander Reentry and Inclusion Through Support and Empowerment, also known as API RISE, which provides support for formerly incarcerated individuals and advocates for criminal justice policy changes in California. He currently works at the mayor's office of the city of Los Angeles and continues to volunteer with API RISE. To open our panel, we'll first hear brief remarks from our special guest, Adi Kochiyama Holman. Adi has served as the director of alumni relations at Advancing Justice Asian Law Caucus in San Francisco for over 25 years. She is also a board member of Eastside Arts Alliance, a community-based arts organization dedicated to building bridges in the racially and ethnically diverse community in East Oakland. Adi is the daughter of the iconic activist Yuri Kochiyama and is currently the co-director of the Yuri Kochiyama Archives Project. We'll now hear first from Adi about her work, the inspiration from her mother, and the legacy of allyship with the Black community. And so now I'll turn things over to Adi. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa, for your introduction, and thank you, Alba, for inviting me. In the midst of COVID-19 and the brutal murder of George Floyd, as well as Armad Arbery and Breonna Taylor and so many others, we are finally waking up to the deep racism and inequities that are so pervasive in our society. People are taking to the streets to say we've had enough. During these past few months, I've been asked many times about my mom, Yuri Kochiyama. My mother was a second generation Japanese American who was born in 1921 in San Pedro, California. Her life was forever changed after the arrest of her father at the onset of World War II. Like other Japanese community leaders, he was unjustly accused of being a spy. Shortly after his release from a prison hospital and his subsequent death, my mom's family was incarcerated along with 120,000 other Japanese Americans and moved to a concentration camp in Jerome, Arkansas. 
After the war, my mother joined my father in New York and eventually moved to a housing project in Harlem in 1960. It is there that my parents became involved with the civil rights movement. They joined the Harlem Parents Committee and had each of their six children take classes at the local Freedom School so that we could learn about African-American culture and history. In October 1963, my mother met Malcolm X and was deeply inspired by his fierce and humble leadership. She joined the Organization of Afro-American Unity, where she studied Black history before his assassination in 1965. Our apartment was a meeting place for movement activists, an open house on Saturday nights for people to meet and to discuss arts and politics, and a place to stay for any out of town visitors, whether it's for one night or several months. As she became more politically active, her involvement was more focused on black liberation, leftist politics and political prisoners. She was also involved in the Asian American movement starting in the late 1960s and was active in the struggle for redress and reparations. What I remember most about my mom was that she was truly dedicated to building community and bringing people together. I think that was her way of developing solidarity before that phrase became popularized. Since she lived, worked, and organized in the Black community, it was a natural extension of her personal life to her movement work. Yuri was always there if someone needed a pro bono lawyer, needed a support committee, needed to borrow money, or needed a place to stay. She also believed that it was critical for all of us to learn the history of oppressed people as well as their own history. Yuri was a voracious reader who used that knowledge to share whenever she wrote or spoke. She always felt strongly that African Americans were the vanguard of the movement and that we needed to listen and learn from their 400 years of oppression from slavery to Jim Crow to continued and systemic racism. All of us are indebted to their relentless struggle to fight for social justice, whether we are Asians, Muslims, Latinx, LBGTQ, or women. My mom inspired me to live my life in service to others and to always fight to make this a better world for all. In high school, my brother and I formed an organization called Students Against Social Injustice. In college, I was involved in ethnic and Asian American studies. And in my work life since moving to the Bay Area, I have worked for progressive nonprofits. I feel privileged to serve on the staff of the Asian Law Caucus, which is an organization that has a 48 year history of representing low income API communities, and more recently has advocated for criminal justice reform, organized to abolish ICE and, and end deportations. And it makes me proud to serve on the board of Eastside Arts Alliance in Oakland, which provides free classes in visual and performing arts to youth and young adults, and combines art and activism in communities of color. I know if my mother was here today, she would be in, energized by the mass uprising and advocating to defend, defund police and abolish ICE. She would fully support Black Lives Matter to resist racism and white supremacy. Yuri believed that it is critical to build solidarity between Black and Asian communities and to build alliances and coalitions within and between our communities. It is up to each of us to demand and struggle for lasting change. It makes me think of one of my mother's quotes, keep expanding your horizon, decolonize your mind, and cross borders. Thank you. Uh, Diane. Yeah, thank you, Adi. And first I wanna thank Brian and Lisa and Charles of the APA Bar Association for organizing this really generative and important series of talks. And I appreciate that we started with Adi, giving us a glimpse of her mother, the tremendously important activist Yuri Kochiyama. So riffing off Adi's comments, I wanna make three points about the significance of Yuri Kochiyama and lessons for Afro-Asian solidarity. 
Um, let me just comment really quickly. The image that you see with Malcolm X is when Malcolm visited the Kochiyamas in 1964. And second to the left is Adi, who was there. Um, the first point that I want to make is that Yuri was seen by Black activists not as an ally, but as a central part of the struggle for Black liberation. She was invited in 1969 to join the Republic of New Africa, or RNA. This may seem contradictory. The RNA was created in a moment of Black power, where formerly integrated groups were creating autonomous Black spaces. Some charge this as an example of narrow nationalism, but the RNA viewed this in terms of Black self-determination. And Yuri respected this, and she joined only when she was invited as one of the very few Blacks who joined the RNA. Could you put up the next slide, please? Why would a Black nationalist group invite her to join? Yuri had already exhibited a history of showing up for Black struggle. She worked in the Harlem Parents Committee for Better Schools for Black and other children in Harlem. She supported Mae Mallory when she was arrested in conjunction with Robert F. Williams in North Carolina in their struggles for Black self-defense. And she worked tirelessly for imprisoned Black activists and other political prisoners. Yes, Yuri entered Black spaces gently. She listened and learned. She centered Black liberation, but she also came into this space as someone who had two decades earlier been locked up in a U.S. concentration camp and whose father died, or I would say was killed by the state as a result of this detention. 1969 was a year in which the US involvement in the Vietnam War was growing and US anti-war protests were massive. Many of the black radicals with whom Yuri worked opposed both the ways poor black people were used as frontline soldiers in Vietnam and the ways the US military and state were killing Vietnamese people and invading and destroying their land. Late in his life, in 1967, Dr. Martin Luther King made one of the most important speeches of his life, Beyond Vietnam or A Time to Break Silence, in which he called the Vietnamese his brother, or that he used the gendered language, but the, the meaning was about a humanizing connection, and drew a direct line connecting Black humanity with Vietnamese humanity. In that speech, he also indicted the United States for its imperial incursions into Guatemala and many other places and charged as, quote, the greatest purveyor of violence in the world, my own government. Certainly not all, but many Black organizations, especially what I call Black revolutionary nationalism slash internationalism, were linking Black power US, in the United States to global third world anti-colonialism. This is the context in which Yuri entered spaces of Black struggle and fought for Black liberation, not as an ally, but as a fellow activist organizer, perhaps a comrade in the language of the times. Sung Yoon Choi Morrow wrote an insightful and important essay in Color Lines called Solidarity, Not Allyship, that I, and I believe she's going to speak on it, so I'm going to only say this very briefly. I do believe the tenets of out, some of the tenets of allyship are important and ought to be embraced. Listening to those most impacted by an issue and learning from them, centering Black life and Black struggle such that it's not time to talk about Vincent Chin and the ways that Asian Americans too have been impacted by white violence and state violence, though this is true. Um, stop, you know, they're also talking about stop asking um, Black Indigenous POC for labor and education without first doing your own research. Recognizing that learning is a process and being willing to own up and apologize for your mistakes and asking what you can do better. But ultimately, I believe solidarity or comradeship is a better model precisely because it works primarily not at the level of addressing individual harms or traumas. Let me be clear that I do believe interpersonal harm is important to address, but solidarity embrace, enables us to create not just safe spaces, but liberated ones. Solidarity enables us to engage in anti-racist struggles against the structures of oppression. This, I believe, is one of the most important lessons that Yuri teaches us about Afro-Asian solidarity. We must center Black lives and Black liberations and in ways that critique and seek to dismantle the systems of white supremacy, 
racial capitalism, colonialism, and heteropatriarchy. The point isn't primarily about the politics of representation. The point isn't primarily to seek the hiring of more black police officers. The point is to create critique power and to seek to create a transformed system that prioritizes people over profits. It might look like defunding the police or an abolitionist future, such as the one Angela Davis has been talking about and helping to build for decades, which isn't just about dismantling, though it is also, it is about imagining and creating the world that we want to live in. Um, could, could you advance to the next slide, please? My second point is that Yuri was constantly engaged in struggle. Audie mentioned this, Yuri was always reading. And I first met her in 1995 in Los Angeles when Yuri gave a talk on Black Asian solidarities throughout history. It was a detailed talk that emerged from her reading and study. She talked about how during the Philippine-American War of 1899 to 1902, U.S. Black soldiers, or some U.S. Black soldiers defected to the Philippine side, coming to see the war in terms of U.S. conquest and white supremacy. She talked about the Afri Af Asian African Conference in Bandung, Indonesia in 1955. Um, the Bandung Conference gathered 29 newly independent countries in Asia and Africa to discuss their common goals to reject global white supremacy, to fight for world peace, and to oppose colonialism, quote, in all its forms, recognizing that the ending of formal colonialism and direct territorial control um, didn't end domination, and that domination could be continued through economic and political control and what Kwame Nkrumah of Ghana called neocolonialism. One of the first things Juries did when she joined the movement in the early 1960s was to join Malcolm X's Organization of Afro-American Unities Liberation School. And she shared with me her meticulous handwritten notes from the Liberation School. She attended every Saturday morning from December 1964 until it closed in April 1965, shortly after Malcolm was assassinated. While she attended only a few months, it transformed her life. She recounted hearing a recording of Fanny Lou Hamer talk about her prison beating, after which Yuri wrote down, racism was a congenital conformity. If racism was not aberrant, but structurally and historically embedded in the very formation of the nation, then it would require critiques of power and radical restructuring beyond gaining black faces in high places to get to a place where Black Lives Matter. Um, could you put up the slide again about the reading list, all the readings? Um, I'm not gonna be able to talk about, there's so many important uh, uh, books and articles and uh, ways to study about black liberation. Um, I, I teach in Asian American studies and my field is indebted to black study and black struggle. Um, but I just want to point out the movement for black lives and their vision statement to check out if you haven't already on the website. It's such an important um, document that was created in 2015 out of a conference and it was over 60 organizations and hundreds of people coming together collectively and figuring out a really multifaceted, far-reaching, um, uh, precisely uh, analyzed formation for how we get to that place that we want, that we envision, that new world. And um, so I really recommend, especially in this moment, it's funny, that moment of 2014-15 seems like a different world from just five years later, um, but it's really important. And here are other books that I want, oh, if we could go back to that one. I want to I wanna also, so I, I'm not going to have time to talk about these, but I think it'd be great just to note them and, and there are so many others, maybe people might want to put them in the chat, other recommendations. But I want to highlight Professor Robin Kelly, um, a formidable black intellectual activist. And he wrote an article called Black Study, Black Struggle, printed in the Boston Review in 2016, that challenges us to think carefully about the work of institutions. What can be done within universities, for example, and what are the limits of institutions to get us to truly transform structures? So Robin Kelly writes, Institutions will never be engines of social transformation. 
Such a tra task is ultimately, the, is ultimately the work of political education and activism. This is not a call to abandon institutions, and I feel that it's my responsibility as a professor to work within the university and to transform it to the extent that it can be. Um, but Robin Kelly challenges us, those of us who work within institutions, to not see the university or the legal profession as the end all for all of our struggles. He advocates Stephen Harney, Harney and Fred Moten's urgings to be in, but not of the university. Robin Kelly also challenges to think about the language of trauma, which of course, it's absolutely essential that we talk about trauma and that we work to end the long history of violence and structural racism against black people. But he also cautions that the language of personal trauma promotes thinking of ourselves as victims rather than agents. And while some speak of blacks knowing nothing but chains, Robin Kelly instead argues that, quote, what sustains enslaved black, uh, black people was a memory of freedom, dreams of seizing it and conspiracies to end it, a fugitive planning, if you will. So he's talking about freedom dreams, which is one of his books up there. And he's talking about not just to see black life as trauma or, or, or social death or violence, but to also see all of its imaginations and strivings for freedom and the ways that black study and black black studies and black struggle have crucially changed our society and our thinking. Um, if you could move to the next slide, please. A third and final lesson that I have from, well, final for today's talk, from Yuri's, <coughs> Yuri Kochiyama centers her humanizing practices. <clears throat> In a piece I wrote on Yuri in a book called Want to Start a Revolution, Women in Black Revolt, I use the term center person leadership to refer to her leadership style. I borrow from Karen Sachs' study of union organizing of predominantly black women clerical workers in the Duke Medical Center. Um, they, the, the, the people who were organizing found that they couldn't gain access to the black workers without going through one woman. And this woman wasn't primarily a gatekeeper. What she was, was the person who threw the baby showers, who organized the socials, who inquired about people's families and lives. Karen Sachs was noting the importance of those who network and attend to social relations, not as secondary, but as essential forms of leadership. Yuri Kochiyama embraced the model of center person leadership. Mutulu Shakur, a political prisoner at, at, the, uh, at the time and a uh, former member of the Republic of New Africa <clears throat> noted, Yuri's was the first number that many black people called when they got out of prison. Why? Because they knew that Yuri wouldn't stop until she got the help that they were requesting, whether that was locating family or friends or a lawyer or services. Yuri attended to the social. I remember attending a political prisoner meeting with her in the Bay Area about 2002. And there were some very contentious debates going on in the meeting. And afterwards, Yuri talked to people on every side of that debate, inquiring about their families and their lives. And some people might see this as skirting the political issue, but that misses the point. Yuri was relating to people in their full humanity and had learned over the years that certain differences, while perhaps important to debate, do not define us or need to create contentiousness. Um, she was famous, as Adi noted, for hosting people in her home. Yuri really embraced collective, horizontal, center-person leadership and humanized the struggle in caring ways. She insisted on intertwining social relations with critiques of power and struggles for Black liberation. And this is the legacy of Yuri Kochiyama. She struggled for transformative change centered on Black liberation linked with liberation of all oppressed peoples, political education and reading, and humanizing ways. Struggle, study, and love. Perhaps these are the central components of Afro-Asian solidarities. Yuri lived her life by the slogan, all lives won't matter until Black lives matter. Thank you. Um, next, we have 
Sung Young Choi Morrow um, to give us some words. Thank you, Diane, for that. Oh my gosh, I could I could listen to you talk for another hour just about your insights um, on on Yuri and just the amazing wisdom and leadership and legacy that she's um, um, left uh, for us. So, yeah, my name is Sonia and Choi Morrow. I'm based in Chicago, um, but I am the executive director of um, an organization called the National Asian Pacific American Women's Forum, or NAPOF for short. Um, and we work to build power with API women and girls across the country so that we can create systemic change uh, to make uh, meaningful improvements in our lives. Um, and in the context of today's talk, um, what I want to highlight is that it, it, you know, for us in doing this work, we don't do it in a silo, um, and we do it in deep partnership with other organizations that are led by women of color, um, whether it's Latina, indigenous women, or black women, um, we work in collaboration around um, collective goals and, and towards each other's uh, interests, right? So um, the piece I wrote really came from, um, it, it, it's titled Solidarity, Not Allyship, um, a call to API community. And, and you know, the, the thesis of it, the essence of it is really talking, of, um, it really came out of my observation of how people, um, how Asian Americans were responding in this time. And it kind of felt like we fell into two camps. Um, and uh, one is the, but what about us, right? And as a Korean American, um, um, I, you know, I've been in lots of conversations in the Chicagoland area, you know, after the the riots and the looting, over 90% of beauty supply stores were were vandalized and looted. Um, majority of those are owned by Koreans, right? And so there was this sense of like uh, reliving the LA riots again. And there were a lot of conversations happening within our community, which, you know, in the context of COVID-19 also, you know, it, it, was, it's a, it was a lot. And so there was this sentiment about of, of what about us, right? Like in this time, in this economy, like our small businesses, I mean, some of those businesses are gone for good, right? And then there was this other camp that was like, you know, sort of really pushing the boundaries on, you know, shaming our community and the anti-Blackness that we hold and showing up for Black Lives Matter in a way that I would expect white people to, but not people of color to, right? It was sort of, it's out of guilt and shame, right? More so than this deeply rooted understanding that if, you know, fighting for black liberation is, is at the end of the day, finding fighting for our own liberation, right? There was this disconnect and it's sort of this like, you know, guilt out of guilt of our relative privilege to whiteness that, oh, we fare better than black folks, so let's go out and do this for them and forget about us kind of mentality. And that's sort of how folks fell into these two camps. And so I wrote this piece that basically was about, well, I don't think it's it's either or. And in fact, we really need, I mean, and not, you know, within our community, you know, I was really talking to our, our community that within our community, we really need to develop a deeper understanding and conversations about white supremacy and systemic racism and how that impacts us as well, right? Not to not to insert and say, oh, look at, and, and, and how about us? If, if you only pay attention to the black people, what happens to us? Not in that way, but to say, oh, it's the same oppressive system that I have experienced that folks are experiencing and sort of having this common language that we can share um, to really understand that it needs to come from a place of genuine self-interest where we understand that um, when we fight white supremacy, whether it is uh, you know, under the banner of you know, defund ICE and uh, abolish ICE or defund the police, that we are fighting the same oppressors for the same goal for liberation for everyone, right? And so, so, so for me, that, that's that been a really important piece for our organization, especially. And one of the things that we've committed to do and have been working on for, for a couple of years is um, really helping members in our organization and, and the way we do our work to really resonate a deep understanding of how racism affects us as well, right? 
because then we're able to show up in collaboration and in solidarity in a way that is much deeply rooted than sort of, you know, this patronizing, like, oh, black people have it so much worse than us. Like, let's let's go support them, right? I mean, that sort of is the attitude. I'm sorry, but that that really is the attitude of, you know, oh, we've we've we're we're faring so much better, right? And that's the general. Um, I, I would say that is sort of the general narrative as well, sort of playing into this model minority stereotype and the model minority myth. So, so um, I, you know, in our work, the way this shows up is that you know we. We, when we work on public policy issue, we don't do it in a silo, um, even if it's something that specifically would impact Asian Americans. Um, and usually it's around like language access and things like that, right? We always do it in collaboration with other women of color organizations because um, we believe that when we advocate for things together, we're stronger together than we are apart. And, and that we sort of, it's kind of like uh, we've taken on a, a village mentality, right? Like your business is my business and my business is your business. And we've built this trust, um, especially doing federal policy work, um, where we have a, a black national organization and a Latina national organization and NAPOF partners really closely. And, you know, our staff are meeting with Hill staffers collectively together all the time, right? Because one of the things we've also learned is that they try to what you know pit us against each other right and so so we go together so they can't say well but you know the asians said this or the latinas said this right and so so i think building that collective power is really important on on a on a daily basis right yes in times like this we need to show up and um we need to be out there on the streets and and you know it, it is atrocious that you know i mean like I don't even know. I don't even know when to start dating back. But like I, re my my most vivid memory was Tray Trayvon Martin and George Zimmerman getting uh, free. My partner and my partner, who's um, African American, and I were driving back from Michigan, and we basically he basically was like, "Oh, I guess we'll never take a road trip to Florida, right?" Like some of these some of these things have like real life implications for some of us. And, and that was like sort of scared in my memory. And that was so, that was how many years ago? And here we are, same place again. And, you know, dealing with the same issues with, with uh, law enforcement and, and white vigilantes who think they can, they can take black lives because they feel under threat, right? And so, so it's not to say that, you, you know, we don't show up when these things happen, but I think that especially in the Asian American community, we need to spend more time intentionally understanding racism and white supremacy, especially, and how that's impacting our community and, and how we live and what we can and cannot do, that it is because of white supremacy that our families are separated. It is because of white supremacy that some of us grew up under colonial rule. I mean, there, you know, it's really to make those connections and to understand that and then to build genuine, organic relationships uh, with other people of color, right? And that's really, for me, what's inspiring about Yuri's life is that this wasn't this what like this wasn't a soapbox that she stood on, right? This was her life. Like this was, you know, these were she was just being her with everybody. It wasn't like she was a mom here and then she did her activist here. Like she was embodied all she embodied all of that. And and I do think that we have, you know. Uh, many of us, um, you know, especially those of us like in the advocacy field, like in the in the in the movement space, really need to take a step back and really think about how are we showing up um, uh, holistically in a way that, you know, we can really um, understand that we're showing up for ourselves, even as we're marching with signs that say that say Black Lives Matter, right? I mean. That, that we can genuinely say Black Lives Matter without feeling like we're gonna be invisibilized, or we can say Black Lives Matter not out of guilt and sort of in this patronizing way of, oh my gosh, I know like I face racism, but Black people have it worse, so let me go out and march for them, right? I think I think neither are our right approaches, and I think um, as we, as we uh, deepen our work on understanding racism and white supremacy, I'm hopeful that as a community that we can be in much more genuine relationship with um, with 
with the Black Lives Matter and the movement for Black Lives. And and I'm so I'm so grateful for folks like Yuri and you know Grace Lee Boggs is another person um, who have demonstrated through fierce leadership. I mean, uh, talk about badass Asian women, right? Like um, that we have that legacy. Um, and in fact, actually, I want to show you guys my shirt. Um, this is a shirt that NAPOP sells. We call it the Four Activist shirt. And you can see Yuri's on there and Grace Lee Boggs and Helen, that's Helen Zia. Um, for those of you who, who know, uh, who may know, she um, worked on uh, Asian American uh, a movement in, in Detroit. So anyway, and if you like the shirt, you can get it at our website at NAPOP.org. Um, uh, we would love your support, uh, but you know we wear this shirt as a reminder that um, one, we didn't, you know, we're not, we're not special and new to this, right? Like we didn't invent this idea of Black Asian liberation or even fighting in, you know, in progressive movement spaces, right? That we are taking on the legacy and really learning and gleaning from the wisdom of so many of, of folks that have gone before us, and I think. That's also another piece is that, you know, we are missing, I mean, I, you know, I talk to so many Asian Americans who say they, they only learn Asian American history at a class in college, right? They took an Asian American studies class, like probably from Diane or someone, someone similar. Um, and that's, that's when they learn our history, right? Like we need to teach our kids, our little ones about Yuri, about Grace, about Helen, about Vincent Chen, about the Chinese Exclusion Act, about all of these things because I think the more we can understand our context and the history and how white supremacy has interacted with our history, the better off we are in understanding the broader and, and really um, um, pervasive sy systemic racism that has uh, dominated this, this country, you know, at, since its in inception when it, you know, when white colonizers came. Um, so I'm gonna stop there and turn it back over to Diane. Yeah, thank you so much, Sung Young. Um, and I really encourage people to read that article that she wrote in Colored Lines, Solidarity Not Allyship. She has a lot of great points and really poignant way with words, it was wonderful. And also I, I like your shirt, but I also wanna just be clear that it isn't just the Yuri Kochiyamas and the Grace Lee Bobs and the Helen Zias and the Nunoch Karoskas. The Asian American movement as a whole extended solidarity. I think it was, I, I, I want to argue, it was one of the hallmarks of the Asian American movements of the 60s and 70s. And I think it continues to this day. And I completely agree with what you're saying. Yuri Kochiyama would say that, you know, our, our own solidarity is intertwined with Black liberation, right? We learn from, we benefit from. Black liberation is central, as Audi said, the vanguard. Um, but 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 they're intertwined. It isn't a charity model. Yeah. Um, and next we have Paul Chung. Paul. Yes. Hi everyone. Um, wow. It's it's so it's so humbling to be part of this panel. Um, I just want to say that from from the very start. Um, so yeah, just just listening to um, to all the um, the panelists speak. I mean, my my own personal journey uh, recently has been just uh, tracing back and learning more about my my roots. Um, my parents were uh, immigrants from Korea. Um, 20th century uh, Korea was uh, defined by um, the intervention of um, uh, imperialist powers, right? Japan, then it was uh, the US and the, the Soviet Union um, in the 1940s. Um, and today we have a, a divided Korea. And, and um, uh, for me, I'm, you know, I grew up in LA. Um, I, I have one older brother. Uh, my my brother my my dad was um, you know he became a pastor, and so um, you know I'll I'll speak a little bit about uh, sort of the demographic curse of uh, of growing up as a API in, in the 80s and 90s. Um, but my my older brother, who's um, four years uh, older than I am, he was um, you know he joined a, a Filipino gang, um, I believe in in high school, um, and. He was actually involved in a um, incident that resulted in a, uh, a shooting outside of a vehicle, and uh, my my brother was actually uh, the driver of the vehicle, and um, the shooter was uh, was one of his friends. Um, but long story short, you know, my my brother was um, tried as a, as an adult in criminal court, 
um, he was convicted of a first degree murder and two attempted first degree murders and was sentenced to uh, 25 years to life in prison. Uh, this was back in the mid 90s. Um, this was basically um, tough on crime, uh, the, th the, the three strikes law, um, and also tough on youth. Um, there was a, a lot of vocabulary about uh, the rise of super predators um, uh, regarding uh, inner city youth at the time. Um, so just providing that as a little bit of background context, um, you know, I, I, I went to law school. Um, I, I wanted to become um, an advocate for immigrant families and youth. Um, the, the first job that I got out of law school was actually at uh, Asian Americans Advance, Advancing Justice LA. Um, and I was given the, the special privilege of, of designing and running a criminal justice project there. Um, my supervisor was uh, Betty Hung. And um, I did a lot of Prop 47 and record, record expungement clinics um, in the API community. So um, the Kamai population in Long Beach, um, you know, we, we did just a lot of cl clinics that were uh, multi-ethnic, multi-racial. And um, in 2014, I, I formed a nonprofit called uh, API Rise. Um, technically, uh, the, the entity name is Project 4 Incorporated, uh, doing business as API Rise. Um, and, and the reason why we formed was because of um, an article published by Angela O oh and Karen Umoto in 2005. It was, it was called um, APIs from Incarceration to Reentry. This was published in uh, 2005 in um, Amer, Asia, uh, Amer Asia Journal. Um, and I just want to point out some key statistics there. Um, between 1990 and 2000, the API inmate population increased by 250%. Um, nearly 65% of those API prisoners were immigrants and refugees. Uh, 64 committed violent crimes compared to 39% for all California um, prison population. And over 20% of those API prisoners um, had a sentence of 25 years or more. Um, so when I, when I talk about the demographic curves, I mean, it, it was, it was pretty bad, you know, just growing up as a API male um, immigrant uh, during those times. Um, I, I want to point out just um, sort of a nod to um, uh, to history, uh, just to give you a little bit more context for why API form, API rise form. So um, the Free Chosu Lead Defense Committee formed in the late 1970s. Um, this was uh, Chosu Lee was an individual who was wrongfully convicted of murder. Um, in 1973 for a San Francisco Chinatown um, gang leader murder case. And, um, and you know, his conviction was based on two eyewitness testimonies. And this is really a case about uh, police racial profiling, um, shoddy police investigation. And this was all exposed by a Korean American journalist, um, K.W. Lee at the time. Um, in any case, um, Cho Su Lee was eventually granted a retrial um, in large part due to the uh, defense committee um, that was formed by, many of them were actually um, Japanese Americans uh, who kind of came, or, came, came to Asia around that time in the 70s. And um, Cho Su Lee's conviction was um, overturned in 1982 and he was released in 1983. Um, but just talking to a lot of people who were part of the committee at that time, um, talking to them now and 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 ref reflection reflecting on that, um, you know, there's there's a lot of stigma for APIs with felony records, and I, I think uh, Cho Su Lee really struggled uh, returning home. Uh, he was a union organizer, but you know, he also had bouts with uh, depression, uh, substance abuse, and um, I, th I think the consensus is that there was an organization that provided. Um, some type of reentry service, um, you know, it might have benefited someone like Cho Su Lee. Uh, we had um, the Asian American Drug Abuse Program at the time, but you know, just very, very few um, organizations that that provided support, um, especially in this area. And then we had we had a couple um, case cases in the two thousands that were uh, legal catalysts. Uh, it really set the stage for changing the sentencing law specifically applied to juveniles um, uh, here in California. Uh, a couple of the cases were like Roper v. Simmons in 2005, uh, Miller v. Alabama in 2012, 
So these are Supreme Court cases that uh, basically held that, um, first of all, in Roper, um, capital punishment for an individual who is under the age of 18 violates the uh, Eighth Amendment, which governs uh, cruel and unusual punishments. Um, Miller v. Alabama held that um, you cannot have a mandatory sentencing scheme imposing uh, a life sentence on a youth under the age of 18. Um, and various amicus briefs who were supported, uh, were, were provided to, the, to support these cases from the, the scientific, medical, and psychological communities that basically said, you know, the brain develops um, a bit later for male youth, um, especially the executive and decision-making uh, functions. And so we shouldn't hold juveniles to the same standards as adults in terms of culpability and, um, and this really got to the, um, the idea that punishment should be proportional to the crime. And so um, those are some of the legal catalysts. Um, also in California, there was a case involving uh, Plata v. Schwarzenegger, um, where you know, a, a federal uh, receivership basically uh, forced California to reduce their prison population. Uh, this was back in 2009 um, because of just egregious violation of uh, healthcare access for inmates. Um, just, just to give you an example, there was a case of um, valley fever, and um, you know, just uh, we had a member who actually was um, almost died on a on a um, emergency table um, because of that, and and valley fever um, affected a lot of uh, blacks and particularly uh, Filipinos. Um, and so um, that really set the stage for a lot of our members coming home. Um, that, that allowed individuals to receive um, an earlier pro hearing date. And um, I, I want to segue a little bit more into uh, API Rise and the, the work that we're currently doing right now. Um, so most of our members are actually former juvenile uh, lifers. Um, they started coming home around 2010. Um, and um, in terms of membership composition, we have a lot of uh, Pacific Islanders. We have uh, some representation of uh, Native, Native Hawaiians, but mostly Southeast Asian. Um, I, I want to talk a little bit about just uh, prison dynamics and then I'll, I'll, t I'll segue into uh, the, the work that we're specifically doing right now. But um, in prison, blacks are not allowed to commingle with uh, other races, uh, particularly whites and, and Latinx. Um, but in certain lockdown situations, Asians and Blacks actually uh, can commingle. Um, and um, a lot of our members have a little bit of, uh, you know, just, just that experience, right? Um, in, in a uh, prison environment that is highly racialized, um, um, segregated, um, and um, what we're trying to do as an organization are um, a couple things. First of all, we're, we're trying to provide prison inreach. Um, we want to support, provide support for reentry. And we also want to uh, build up leadership capacity for our members. Um, so policy advocacy, uh, more recently solidarity building, and also the, the space um, of social enterprise. And um, one of the things that we've actually done recently was form um, a Black and API solidarity group. Um, we understand that uh, as APIs, we lack visibility, and there's um, there's a lot of uh, stigma and shame around around these issues of having um, a felony conviction. Um, but we also realize that the criminal justice movement should have um, a wider united front. And um, part of the work that we're doing is um, creating healing circles, um, but we also want to be very explicit in terms of um, building solidarity with um, uh, the Black community here in Los Angeles. Um, one of the things that we're doing um, is uh, revisiting uh, Latarsha Harlan's case. Um, and that was kind of like the precursor to the 92 civil unrest um, as part of our healing circle. Um, so those are some of the work that we're currently doing right now. Um, in terms of areas of need, immigration relief and removal defense, uh, a lot of that work is being led by uh, the Asian Law Caucus. Um, we also have governor pardons and, and commutation requests for our members. 
Um, and also, I think a big area that kind of cuts across um, just this general field of criminal justice is uh, removing barriers to reentry. These are so, something that we call collateral conse consequences of incarceration. Um, for instance, you can't have a license um, in certain areas um, in order to, to get employment, for instance, uh, financial sector, uh, certain service sectors, and um, it has absolutely no nexus to the type of crime that you committed uh, with, with the job description. So removing some of those barriers to employment, uh, housing, and also uh, voting rights, those are, those are probably um, some, some key areas that, um, that we would need to uh, tackle. So um, I just want to say that, you know, this, this has been such a, um, I mean, it's just, it's just so amazing within the last couple of years uh, to work with individuals who uh, spent most of their adulthood lives uh, behind bars and, and to uh, really walk with them um, and also to continue to evolve and to also educate, educate our own community about these issues. And, and to build uh, just new leadership. I mean, this is, this is extremely exciting. And, and that's, that's the reason why um, I continue to stay involved with uh, APRIs. But, um, but I want to end with that and um, hand, it, hand it back over to uh, Diane. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Paul. And thank you for the work that API Rise is doing. And I think it's so important the, I mean, uh, uh, Yuri Kochiyama worked for trying to support uh, Asian American prisoners. And one of the things that was hard was trying to find lawyers who would come on board, right? Maybe work pro bono. And the work of lawyers are so essential in these times and in the social movements. And you're demonstrating through API uh, Rise how some of that can work. So thank you for that. And I'll turn over to Lisa Monk for questions and comments. Okay, so I'd like to thank all the panelists again for uh, their insightful remarks today. Um, there was a question in the chat about whether it's possible to get a list of recommended reading uh, emailed to the participants. And uh, we will work on compiling those resources and sending them out to, to you all. Um, so that won't be an issue. I did have hey, one. Lisa, I mean, may I say something very quickly on sure. that? So um, I, I just want to quickly say that the Boston Review, which is where Robin Kelly's Black Struggle Black Studies is from, um, has a list of readings that people can do on a variety of topics, including Black liberation. And um, also there are different things on the website now, and probably others can put it in the chat too. I've seen things on Asian and Black solidarity. I've seen things on Asian American, and no, African American feminism and Asian American feminism. And so there's a lot of readings and suggestions online but also, yes, we can also compile some things. Thank you, Diane. Mm -hmm. I did have one question for all of you, um, and that is based on your work and your practice areas, what are some concrete ways that we can show up in solidarity with the current Black Lives Matter movement? I guess I can, I can start then. Um, I think that going back to what I had talked about, the Movement for Black Lives vision statement, lists such a wide variety of things that can be done to deal with structural change, uh, issues around defunding and demilitarizing and de-weaponizing the police is one, because we know that when we do that, right, that it is Black communities disproportionately being impacted by policing. It impacts all of us, but it disproportionately impacts Black communities. And I think that's one of the things that, that can really be done in a very serious way. And this is a place where we need lawyers, I think, to, to help with all of this. Um, and, and I think that the, a second thing that I think that's really important is to do reading and study of Black struggle, um, of whatever it, areas it is that we're working in, I think some of it can be right talking and listening and finding out what maybe Black Lives Matter movements in your area uh, are working on and, and are asking of people to do. But I think some of it is also deepening the work and intensifying the work that we've already been doing. It's not time to just drop all this other kind of work. For example, in Santa Barbara, um, we are working 
uh, we had gotten ethnic studies in the high schools and now there's intensified work around that. And I think ethnic studies, what it really offers is sustained learning across time. That's crucial to, to really uh, changing, uh, to, to gaining an analysis, to deeper reading, to deeper thinking, hopefully mixed with, with engagements. Um, and I just want to say quickly, in Santa Barbara, we're starting Cooperation Santa Barbara, which is trying to develop an alternative political economy based on co-ops, worker ownership, and so forth, as small businesses are devastated in the time of COVID, right? Um, and we're borrowing so heavily from Cooperation Jackson, um, which, which grows out of the RNA and Black struggle in Jackson, Mississippi. Sun Young, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, sure. I would like to add that, you know, I think one of the things that um, I've been thinking a lot about and also, you know, want us as a community to think a lot about is, um, I know we talk about how the model minority is a myth and it's not true and it, it, it you know, negatively impacts members in our community. But I do, you know, and I've actually kind of sat down to do this as a personal exercise, to sit and think about like how how are we benefiting from that that stereotype and how are we actively going to um, resist that right like that that I think is like a very day to day type of thing that we can all do um, that you know as overachieving like pressure from parent you know immigrant generation parents to go and do all the professions that they imagined for us and all of those things like how do we um you know there's a lot of i think i think there is a lot of um conflict and turmoil in thinking about like you know um how do we live that out in a way that isn't just you know that really isn't just going about perpetuating the the stereotype and and i think one of the things that we need to stop doing is just keeping our heads down and minding our business. I don't think that serves anybody. I think that shaming uh, members of our community that's been incarcerated is awful. I think the anti-blackness in our community around even like, it's not even black, anti-blackness, just terrorism, right? Like I know so many Korean families who are like dead worried if, they're friend, if their kids are friends with Filipinos, right? Because Filipinos, God forbid, are not good people or whatever. So so I, I, I would like for us to examine those things as well. I, I think right now in the moment, um, we we do need to stand up for our, um, Southeast Asian um, communities uh, because they're disproportionately impacted by um, immigration policies. And until we get some lasting, um, you know, immigration reform, I mean, this is basically the the space that we're occupying right now. Um, and and more recently, um, start, you know, building solidarity and uh, supporting the movement. Um, but I, I, I think I think for us, I mean, it's, yes, a lot of it is immigration. And, um, you know, a lot of the work is, um, has been done by uh, uh, ALC and, con continue, and they continue to do a really great job. Um, the the other area that I, that I see is, um, you know, as Asian Americans, we have, um, we have privilege, we have a lot of privilege. And part of that is, um, Occupying more, more kind of international space, um, there's um, a lot of inter interconnected issues such as um, um, trafficking um, and some of the, some of the, a lot of abuses that go on there. But also the the Im immigration issues. I mean, it just cuts across um, so many different ethnicities and, and races. I mean, you have um, Haitian Americans, right, who are um, undergoing removal proceedings, and um, you know. A lot of times when we th think about um, Black yeah. Americans, we, we think about uh, yeah. you know uh, uh, African Americans um, who have been here for many generations. But um, but yeah, I, th I think there there is a, a space and opportunity for us to kind of um, stretch that scope a little bit. Uh, we also basically um, try to work a lot in the uh, in the labor movement as well because um, a lot of times our, our members can only find um, meaningful um jobs in the construction field and so um you know working with uh for instance um asian pacific american uh labor alliance uh we've worked in, in the past with uh crac on on some of these um immigration um policy reform so um 
yeah, there's there's just a lot of ways to get involved, and um, you know, I, I think I think using our privilege to really stretch the boundary, and just not being afraid to, um, you know, just just getting, uh, you know, just changing the way we engage in these conversations and educating our own community, um, but also getting down to, into the work, um, and and um, and really. Um, you know, there's there's that perception that Asian Americans are bystanders, and um, and I, I think one thing that we could do is just just get more involved, volunteer more, <laughs> and uh, hopefully that'll uh, challenge some of those uh, uh, stereotypes and perceptions. Thank you, Paul, and thank you to all our panelists today for your insightful remarks and discussion. Uh, thank you to everyone for joining us. Our next session in the conference series is Beyond Allyship the case for repeal of Prop 209, and it will be this Thursday, July 2nd at noon. To register for the next session, please go to tinyurl.com backslash APA allyship. But if you've already registered for the conference, there's no need to re-register. The link for future panels will be emailed to you. We hope you'll join us as we continue this important dialogue. Thank you. <laughs>